Covenant Church has been rooted in the North Park, San Diego neighborhood for over 70 years. We believe that God is restoring his creation and renewing lives in our church, our neighborhood, our city, and cultures around the world for his glory. My name is Patrick, and I'm the lead pastor here, and I'd personally love to invite you to join us Sunday at 10 a.m. in North Park at the corner of Howard and 30th. Thanks. Well, good morning and welcome to Covenant Church. If you're a guest, a special welcome. My name is Patrick and I'm the pastor here at Covenant. And, you know, as Paul played in the prelude, uh, and we're going to sing later today the line, it is well with my soul. And it's worth asking what gives us the power and the ability to believe that, to sing that. And our call to worship today from Psalm 77 speaks of God being great and holy. It speaks of him doing mighty acts. It speaks of him being the redeemer. And he hasn't stopped working that way. And so because God is great and holy and he works mighty acts and he is our redeemer, we can say whether we are in a mountaintop or in a valley, it is well with my soul because God is good and he's good to us. So I invite you to stand, if you will, as we read our call to worship this morning from Psalm 77 that reminds us of the goodness and the greatness and the holiness of God. I'll do the leader portion and invite you all to join in in the all portion. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. Father, we praise you this morning. Together we declare that you are great, you are holy, you are mighty, you are strong. You are everlasting. And yet you're near and you're close and you're incarnate and your spirit is with us and you are good and you're good to us. And this morning, help us in heart and mind to remember your mighty acts, to remember your wonderful deeds, to remember you, our redeemer, and you continue to work and you continue to redeem. And we pray all this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
is well with me. Good morning, you can be seated. Uh, it's been a while since uh, worship has brought me to tears, but um, as we get into our confession of sin, what better way than uh, through it all, it is well with our soul, through it all. Um, and this confession of sin is really just our acknowledgement and need of a savior. So if you may, uh, please read over the prayer of confession silently, and then we'll say it out loud together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever, amen. Please take a moment silently to confess your sins to God. God, thank you through all our mess, all our sin, all of our misdeeds, um, our mistreating of people, that you can forgive us daily, every moment, and that you can make it well with our soul. God, we pray that we can just acknowledge our need for you every day, and we pray this in your son's name. Amen. On the next page, we have some words of encouragement from Romans 8. They read, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And as we read the Apostles' Creed together, may we please rise. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting, amen.
Pray with me. Lord Jesus, that is our prayer. That we experience and have more of you. Because it is through you that we have our passion. It's through you that we have our purpose. It's because of you that we have our hope and eternal life. And for that we thank you. In your precious name, amen. Well, good morning. Uh, it is, from, from the standpoint of back here, it is great when the worship team hear you singing. It feeds our uh, passion to sing as well. So thank you for singing this morning with us. Uh, now is the opportunity for the elementary students to go to the lobby and meet your teachers for today. And it's an opportunity for the rest of us to engage with someone that you perhaps don't know standing nearby uh, for the next five minutes. I'm sorry for being about 30 seconds late after the timer went down. I know that bugged a lot of you. Uh, my name is Jake. Um, I help serve here with the youth and the mercy ministries. Um, just a couple of announcements, actually four, so a few. Uh, woman Bible study is going over the Ten Commandments. Please reach out to Kennerly to get involved with that. I don't think she's in here right now. But, oh, yes, she is. Yes. She can be found at any section of the church at any moment. Uh, yes, and the times are listed on your bulletin for Mondays or Thursdays. Uh, covenant classes are also starting before church on February 6th. So it'll, we'll start doing them every Sunday starting February 6th. And it's kind of just a deeper dive into scripture um, and how we can apply that to our lives. And then uh, lastly here, a uh, celebration of life for Eunice Taylor. She was a member of the church for a very long time, served our community very well, and just a, a faithful servant of Jesus. Um, and we'll end our announcements and just... Prayer for her and her family. God, we thank you um, for Eunice's life, her dedication and service to you, um, her relentless approach to telling people about you, your good news, um, and just the, the impact she, she had on North Park, uh, San Diego, and really internationally, Lord. Um, and we cannot thank you enough uh, for her presence in our lives. We say all this in your son's name. Amen. And now for the reading of today's scripture. Thank you. The scripture reading is Mark 2, 1 to 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. 
Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him, to Jesus, because of the crowd, they made an open, opening in the roof about Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat that man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say, to this par which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praise God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. This mic is a little weird, so I'm going to take a moment to get situated here. My name is Hannah Hammond, and I'm one of the pastoral interns here at Covenant. Um, one of the perks of being an intern, for better or worse, is that we all get to preach. So here I am today. Patrick sent out an email a couple months ago uh, giving us each of our, our specific texts that we would be preaching on. And I'm a new mom as well. My daughter Ruthie is about to be nine months old. And so naturally, I checked this email at a ridiculously early hour of the morning. And I was so appreciative of the text that Patrick assigned to me, because although not paralyzed, even though it feels that way sometimes as a new mom, in the season of motherhood, I have often felt like I just need to be carried to Jesus. So whether you are weary and tired or however, you're showing up this morning. I think this passage offers a lot of hope for all of us. So join me in prayer and then we'll dive in. God, thank you for this beautiful morning, the opportunity to gather together, to sing, to be still for a moment. Pray that your spirit would open our eyes and ears, our hearts, our bodies, to your voice this morning through these words from Mark, that we would leave here knowing you more intimately as Jesus, our healer. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The kingdom of God has come near. Mark emphasizes several times in the first chapter that this is good news. And there's a new king, Jesus, the Messiah, a term for the long-awaited savior and redeemer of the Jewish people. Many at the time believed the Messiah would come in strength and power and revolutionary might to overthrow their oppressors and bring healing and peace to the land. Mark is also writing to a Roman audience, an audience that valued power and control and brute strength in the building of their empire. But Mark immediately confronts these worldviews and ours by describing Jesus as a new kind of king. He writes in chapter one that Jesus, the king, inaugurates his reign with a baptism in water by his rough and rugged cousin John and a 40-day trip to the wilderness, something surely no one expected. And then to further disrupt expectations, Jesus returns from the wilderness only to go to the margins of society, to some fishermen in Galilee, to those oppressed by demons and impure spirits in Capernaum, to a woman sick in bed, to a man with leprosy, and many others who had diseases. The kingdom of God has come near to the vulnerable, 
How surprising, how disorienting it must have been to have your hoped for king draw near to the powerless. Mark highlights this theme throughout his gospel account. King Jesus and the kingdom of God he calls forth both in speech and action are not what anyone expected. And today we're going to explore how Jesus, the upside down king, also disrupts what we think we might know about healing for us in our world. So Jesus is in a crowd, a crowd so big, in fact, that Mark says right out of the gates in verse two, there was no room left, not even outside the door. We can forget all six foot social distancing protocol. This place is packed. Most biblical scholars believe that the crowd was at Peter's house, one of the disciples. Perhaps Peter felt pride and honor to have so many people in his home listening to Jesus teach. But I wonder if his stomach dropped when he heard the clatter and commotion come from above Jesus' head, or if his heart beat with anxiety as he watched the first bits of rubble from his roof fall on the heads of his house guests. A hole in the roof large enough to fit the paralyzed man, his mat, plus his four friends, carrying him was a likely disruption he did not expect. And imagine the four friends peering down at Jesus, breathless, no doubt, from heaving their friend up to the roof. Maybe some sheepish laughter. Did we actually just do this? Or some pointing fingers. This was definitely his idea. This made me think of my brother, Thomas, and his gaggle of childhood friends. There was always an instigator when they got together usually Thomas or his best friend David, someone to double dog there, someone else to climb to the top of the roof, literally, or to the top of a tree or to do something otherwise totally ridiculous. Maybe there was an instigator in this story, someone to suggest that going through the roof would definitely be the best option. However it happened, it's clear that these four men made an outrageous commitment to bring their friend in need to Jesus. Their resilient faith, stubborn hope, and maybe a little good humor, too, emboldened them to carry their friend to the rooftop, dig a hole, and wait with great expectation for healing. And imagine the paralyzed man. Maybe he had heard, if not also witnessed, some of Jesus' prior healings. Maybe, like the other four, he too was full of faith and hope that Jesus would bring healing to his body. Or perhaps he had no faith at all. His immobilized body very likely confined him not only to his mat, but to the outskirts of his community. Maybe as his friends carried him to the roof and lowered him down to Jesus, he felt nothing but doubt. His body present before Jesus only as a matter of borrowed faith and hope from the other four. And then he hears Jesus say in verse five, son, your sins are forgiven. How disappointing. At least I imagine I would feel that way. His hope, if any even existed in the first place, his desire, that which he believed could save and renew his life, would be to walk again. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven? Jesus' response is disruptive to the paralyzed man's assumptions about the kind of healing he needed. And I'm sure also to the friends who are willing to break through the roof to see him walk again. And Mark writes that there's at least an internal uproar from the teachers of the law. Imagine dedicating your entire life to the study of the law, to the personal and communal obedience to that law, the law that very clearly states that it is only God who can forgive sins. Of course, then, the teachers of the law think he's blaspheming. Not only is Jesus gathering near to those on the margins of the religious community, his proclamation of the forgiveness of sins is a declaration that he is God, a claim that wildly disrupts all of their assumptions. So this is the context in which we find Jesus, our healer, the disruptive king in the second chapter of Mark. He's sitting in the center of a crowded house, in the center of all the commotion of a broken roof, in the center of the eager hope of the four friends, the desperate longings of the paralytic, and the angry fears of the teachers of the law. And in only a way that Jesus can do, in the center of it all, he presents a riddle of sorts in verse 9. Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? Hmm. 
Mark doesn't give us much time to reach a conclusion before Jesus says, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he heals the paralyzed man. I tell you, he says, get up, take your mat and go home. And the man gets up and goes. These are radical declarations of healing from Jesus. And Mark says that the crowd is amazed. We have never seen anything like this. Amazed, bewildered, in awe, Jesus, the surprising king, has declared his divinity, that he is the Messiah, the king who has come with power and authority, but not the kind of power and authority that anyone expected. He comes with a subversive power and authority to forgive and to heal the deep wounds of disconnection that sin created between God and humanity. Jesus, our healer, Emmanuel, God with us, our king who draws near to the vulnerable. And this is a radical declaration of our healer, Jesus' humanity, his compassion, empathy, and care for this man's body. I imagine Jesus delighted in healing this man and commissioning him to get up and walk. Jesus, Emmanuel, is the maker, creator, sustainer of every body and the one who knows what it's like to live in a body to breathe in and out, to laugh, to have friends, to eat and drink. And as Mark will write in coming chapters, Jesus knows what it's like to cry, to sweat, to suffer, to be oppressed, confined to the margins, paralyzed upon a cross, unable to move, to walk. Jesus, our healer, is our God who is intimately acquainted with our pain because he bore our pain. If you stick with us through the rest of our sermon series in Mark, you'll see that Mark continuously highlights and alludes to the death of Jesus. Why? Because Mark sees Jesus' death as his greatest triumph and his coronation as king. How surprising, how disorienting that Jesus' enthronement as king is his crucifixion his procession to Golgotha, his purple robe, his crown of thorns, his body exalted up, beaten and nailed to a cross. Jesus, our wounded healer, defeats death only after he dies a death of sacrificial love. And in perhaps the most surprising act of subversive power and the wildest disruption ever, Jesus resurrects from the dead three days later. Jesus knew what we needed to heal. The paralyzed man and his four friends thought that healing would look like walking again, restored physical healing. And although this healing did eventually take place, it is secondary to Jesus proclaiming a deeper healing work of forgiveness in this man's life. The teachers of the law were convinced that healing would come from perfectly obeying the law, and eventually, maybe, from a politically powerful and mighty Messiah. The Romans, again Mark's original readers, thought healing would come from the establishment of a powerful and strong empire. Jesus disrupts all of these assumptions about what healing is like and what kind of healing humanity really needs. And Jesus confronts our assumptions about healing too. The mic. The assumption, for example, that I can heal myself by myself. I don't need any friends carrying me through any roofs. I don't need my family, a therapist, or any outside support. And that's either because I don't need healing at all, or if I do need healing, I can heal through my own strength, my own goodness, my own control. The teachers of the law and the Romans thought that they could heal this way, by their own righteousness and power. And for us, New Year's resolutions, dieting, exercise plans, endless cycles of self-help books and activities. Again, none of these bad by any means, but they speak profoundly to that desire each of us has for our transformation and healing to be within our own control and power. This journey of healing is often not sustainable and can lead to further isolation and disconnection from God, ourselves, and others. 
Or there's the assumption that I know what I need to heal. Like the paralyzed man, sometimes when I hear that Jesus has forgiven my sins, to be very honest with you, I feel disappointed. I come to church or I open my Bible or I, I attempt to bring my often anxious heart and body before God in prayer and I feel like I, need, I, I know what I need to make it better. I need more time, I need more sleep, definitely need more sleep. I need less responsibility, more money, a different job, and on and on and on. And the news that I'm forgiven can feel like old news, not good news, when my needs are urgent and apparent. Wouldn't it be easier and even maybe more efficient if I just took healing into my own hands? But in these assumptions about the individuality of our healing, King Jesus, the disruptive healer, has challenging invitations for us to repent or turn our assumptions upside down. The four friends dug a hole in the roof and lowered the paralyzed man down to the feet of Jesus. What a picture of the church, the body of Christ. If there's the assumption that I can heal on my own, there's certainly also the assumption that I don't need to engage in anyone else's healing process. I don't need to get too close to the vulnerability or pain of another. It's inconvenient, it's messy, it's disruptive. But I wonder if Jesus' invitation is that this kind of friendship, this digging through the roofs for each other kind of friendship is vital for our healing. Maybe some of you already see yourself in the story of these four friends. In fact, I know many of you in this church already have this kind of friendship. That's amazing. Keep digging, I would say. Imagine what kind of healing could happen among us and in our neighborhood if we had the courage and commitment to bring the needs of others before Jesus in this way, both in prayer and in tangible action. And maybe it feels like you're in a season where you're the one on the mat, present before Jesus mostly on borrowed faith from a friend. First, welcome. This is how we all get to Jesus. And also, his words to the paralyzed man are words to me and to you. Daughter, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus invites us into healing that is deeply embedded in relationship. Renewing and restoring our connection to God, to one another, to ourselves, and into healing that holistically transforms us. The lens of spiritual formation can give us helpful language, I think, for understanding better this kind of holistic, transformative healing of Jesus. Ruth Haley Barton, she's the author and founder of the Transforming Center, uh, defines spiritual formation as the process of Christ being formed in us for the glory of God, for the abundance of our own lives, and for the sake of others. Well, I'll say that again. Spiritual formation is the process of Christ being formed in us for the glory of God, for the abundance of our own lives, and for the sake of others. The key words there are being formed. Our healing, our becoming like Christ, is not something that we form or control for ourselves, but something God forms within us. Dr. Mulholland a mentor of Ruth Haley Barton's, continues that spiritual formation is a journey into becoming persons of compassion, persons who forgive, persons who care deeply for others and the world, persons who offer themselves to God to become agents of divine grace in the lives of others, in brief, to become persons who love and serve as Jesus did. So our healing then, our formation toward wholeness, our becoming like Christ is not something that we do to ourselves and for ourselves, but rather a continual lifelong process of formation that we commit to and open ourselves to receiving from God day after day. Spiritual disciplines like prayer, reading scripture, gathering together in worship, loving our neighbors, these matter but it shifts from a posture of control to what can I do to shape my relationship with God to a posture of receptivity. How might God transform and heal me, my community, as I open myself to receive through these practices? Mulholland calls this the great reversal or the upside down kingdom plot twist, if you will, from being the subject who controls all things to being a person who is shaped by the presence, purpose, and power of God in all things. 
which leads to another assumption, which is that healing is immediate and linear. If healing doesn't happen fast, it's not going to happen at all, or if it's going to happen, it's going to be nice and tidy and follow a, a clean progression of events. Some of you know that up until very recently, I have been working as a mental health therapist in San Diego. And I think this is probably one of the most common assumptions that is made about the therapeutic process. It sounds good to maybe schedule four or five sessions, you'll talk about your problems, the therapist will tell you how to fix all the problems, and you'll feel better right away, definitely by the end of the first session, and everything in your life will basically be healed and wonderful after a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. If you have ever been to therapy, or you know someone who's been to therapy, you know that this is not how it goes. Certainly, as we can see in this passage in Mark, healing can happen and does happen quickly. But most healing is a slow, slow process for wounds of all kinds, physical, emotional, spiritual, relational. And healing rarely progresses in linear fashion. Often with my clients, I will draw a big loop-de-loop -loop squiggle, which I have a picture of here. Um, in one of our first sessions and explain that this is often what healing looks more like. But if healing is not immediate nor linear, what does it mean then when healing doesn't happen at all? When suffering persists? It's easy to assume that if healing doesn't happen, God is either not good or he is absent entirely. K.J. Ramsey is a writer and therapist who lives with a chronic pain condition that affects her spine. And she recently wrote a book called This Too Shall Last, Finding Grace When Suffering Lingers, where she wrestles with God's presence in her suffering. She writes poignantly, what if suffering isn't ruining ourselves but recreating them? Suffering is an invitation to live and tell the story truer and more satisfying than pain-free ease. It is an invitation to know and be known by the God who entered the human story intent on transforming death into life. The presence of prolonged suffering begs us to remember our true story and its suffering, Lord. These are striking words for any of us who have ever prayed for healing and not received it. For those who have been stuck in the suffering of any kind of pain, of a disability, medical condition, mental illness, broken relationship, oppressive system. Could suffering really be part of our recreating, renewing, transforming journey? That's uncomfortable, unexpected, disruptive. Writer and musician Strahan Coleman says of his own journey to befriend suffering, to suffer is Christ if that suffering is welcomed as an opportunity to endure if we embrace it not as a strange trial, but a cruciform ascent. As we do, all our pain is just that, pain. It's not compounded by confusion, anger, divine loneliness, or fear. And that's not to diminish pain, grief, and loss, or to want it. It's just to dethrone it, to put it where it belongs, under the care of God. There, he transforms it, bringing resurrection to us in strange, albeit painful ways. Maybe, maybe, the places where we suffer and feel the most vulnerable are the very places where Christ is wanting to do the most to be formed in us. An interesting thought, perhaps, for us individually and collectively as a society. Maybe the places where we feel like we least want God to go are the places where he is already present, eager to heal and bring resurrection life. Mulholland, again, says that God meets us in those places of our lives that are most alienated from God. God is there in grace, offering us the forgiveness, the cleansing, the liberation, the healing we need to begin the journey toward our wholeness and fulfillment in Christ. And this is so evident even in only the first two chapters of Mark. Jesus, our upside-down king, our disruptive healer, comes proclaiming that the kingdom of God is near to the vulnerable, to us. The other thing I learned as a therapist is that healing cannot happen without vulnerability. In part, I think it's because the act of being vulnerable in and of itself is very powerful. But even more so, I found that it's that healing happens when someone's vulnerability 
is met with a loving and embracing presence. And this, in essence, is the invitation of, rep of repentance. When our vulnerability, our sin, the places within us and around us where we need healing are confessed and shared honestly and are met with the loving, embracing, forgiving, cleansing presence of Jesus. So as we come to the end of our time of sitting with Mark 2, 1 through 12, at least for today, I want to invite us into a time of repentance. And to accompany this time, I want to introduce you to one of my favorite prayer practices, breath prayers. Some of you may have, are fam may be familiar with this. For others, it may be new, but it is what it sounds like. It's a prayer that is matched with our inhales and exhales of our breath. And I love this practice because it creates space for God to not only shape our minds and our hearts, but also our bodies. For some of you, this might feel uncomfortable, and that's okay. I challenge you to try it anyway. I imagine even the most stoic of some of you Navy guys know the power of breath. Put very simply, our autonomic nervous system has two parts. One part, the sympathetic nervous system, it activates our bodies. It triggers that fight, flight, freeze response when we perceive a threat. The other part, the parasympathetic nervous system, restores our bodies to a state of calm. Breathing, and particularly that mindful, attentive breathing that we're gonna practice in a moment, activates that parasympathetic nervous system. Breathing in this way triggers an automatic process that God designed for us to experience restoration in our bodies. It's amazing. And I wonder if for many of us, even the words repentance or sin can activate our sympathetic nervous systems in the fight, flight, freeze response. Maybe you even felt your breath shorten or your muscles tighten up just moments ago when I said we were going to move into a time of repentance together. For some of you, repentance may feel like a threat because you only have associations with it to shame, guilt, trauma, or hurt. My hope is that these breath prayers might be a new way for you and for all of us to come before God, anchoring our bodies in the promise that we've been talking about today, that Jesus draws near to the vulnerable, to us in love. Jesus is the safest place for us to be vulnerable because he made himself the most vulnerable in an act of wildly disruptive love for us. So as we breathe in and out in prayer in a moment, we are inviting space for God's formation in us to happen, literally in the body through the parasympathetic nervous system and also holistically leaning into an embodied trust of Jesus, our healer who promises to heal and transform us, even in and especially in ways that we do not expect. So I'm going to lead us into this time just by inviting you to breathe with me for a moment. We all breathe all the time, but often we don't notice our breath. So just find your breath. And I'm going to read the first breath prayer aloud and practice it for you. And then I'm going to invite you to join me and practice it. To be vulnerable is to be like Christ. And now join me. To be vulnerable is to be like Christ. And the next one, Jesus, my healer, forgive me and join me. Jesus, my healer, forgive me. So as we move into this time, there's going to be some moments of silence, and I'd invite you to linger on these breath prayers if you like. It can also just be led into a, a time of prayer how you wish. But let's turn now for a few moments toward this upside-down king, our healer, Jesus. Now 
Now hear these words of Jesus to you, daughter, son, your sins are forgiven. And in light of this good news, we turn today to the table. Several years ago, I was back home in Texas visiting uh, my home church there. My dad's a pastor there, and he had preached a sermon and was leading us toward the communion table, and he had blessed the bread, and he picked up the cup to bless it as well. And the pitcher, it was a pitcher filled with grape juice, good Presbyterians we are, and the pitcher broke as he raised it up, and it literally broke, and the pitcher, the handle fell off, and the grape juice went everywhere. I'm sure it sprayed people in the front row. It was a mess, and it was so striking. I think all of us sort of had to catch our breath for a moment because that visual just was like nothing we'd ever experienced in communion before. Usually, communion is such a neat and tidy thing, especially now with COVID. We have these cute little pre-packaged communion packets, you know, but the pitcher breaking and the grape juice going everywhere is a poignant visual of what we are remembering and celebrating at this table, that Christ's journey to bring about our healing was disruptive and messy and involved suffering. And maybe our journey of healing and growth toward wholeness in Christ is no different. This table is a promise for us of the ultimate healing to come, and it's nourishment for us now as we live in the in-between places of Christ being formed in us for the glory of God, for the abundance of our own lives, and for the sake of others. So come, let us eat at the table of our disruptive king. I'll pray for us. God, thank you that you are willing to disrupt our lives, that you come to us in love. You are not afraid of our vulnerability. You are not disappointed in our vulnerability. You love us immensely more than we can even imagine. Thank you for this passage today and the invitation to lean in to maybe a, a new and surprising aspect of who you are as Jesus, our healer, our king. Thank you for this church and this body gathered together today. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Hannah. And as Hannah pulled out of that passage and and how so powerfully Mark 2 shows us the, the creator God who created our bodies in the Imago Dei and who the creator then became part of creation and as Hannah shared, took on a body, became one of us. And as we come to the table, we remember the body and the blood of Christ, the, the grace and the mercy of Christ given to us for the forgiveness of our sins. That one day, this world will be the way it's supposed to be and there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. All bodies will be restored. And we trust in Christ that also, and at a deeper level, our sins are forgiven. And so as we come to this table, we're mindful of, of the body of the incarnation. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, he took the cup, the cup of the new covenant in his blood, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. And whenever we eat from the bread and we drink from the cup, we proclaim Jesus' death. We proclaim that one day all paralyzed will walk. We proclaim that in Christ all sins are forgiven. That we proclaim that reality until Jesus comes again. So, Father, thank you for this table. Thank you for disrupting our lives. Lord, thank you when all of us in different ways and in different forms were brought to you, Jesus. You didn't meet us with a clenched fist. You didn't meet us with a scolding face. We didn't meet you angry. He tells us, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, all who are doubting and confused. Come to me, 
and I will give you rest. You greet us with a smile and embrace and a loving touch, and you do that now. I pray as we hold, as we take, as we eat, as we taste, we might remember how we are greeted by you, Jesus. And we pray all this in the strong name of Christ. Amen. So by grace, through faith, I invite you to take and to eat and to drink now.
Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Receive the benediction. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you today. Amen.